All right, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here today um, and have an opportunity to talk with you a little bit about the work that we do at One Qubit. Um, <clears throat> so far today, we've heard uh, various people speak about things like machine learning, um, various types of optimization problems. Um, Daniel, in the end of the first session this morning, spoke uh, very briefly at the end about there being this sort of background algorithm that runs in their um, systems. And it's up to me today to talk a little bit about, um, a little bit, get a little bit closer to the coal face than the people have done um, so far today. I'm even going to throw a couple of mathematical equations at you. I apologize for that in advance. I certainly don't expect anybody here to be mathematicians or physicists, even though many of you might be. Um, what I'm going to do is start off by talking a little bit about um, generic optimization problems, um, where they fit into the use of the D-Wave machine. And then I'll talk about various applications that we look at um, at one qubit and uh, help uh, various of our industry partners um, solve. So I will uh, skip over this slide uh, um, reasonably quickly, but um, just in case any of you haven't heard of one qubit, which is really my working assumption here, um, one of the things we see at one qubit every so often is media coverage that says, gee, very soon, there's going to be a quantum computing software company. Well, one qubit is there already. We've been there for about 18 months or so. Um, and we have one focus and one focus alone, and that is solving optimization problems using the D-Wave 2 processor. Um, we're based in uh, Vancouver, similar to D-Wave, um, although we have offices in Toronto as well. And as I say, our primary focus is to work with industry partners um, to understand the optimization problems that they have on a daily basis um, and to, uh, to help them solve those using um, the D-Wave machine. And we'll see how we do that over the next uh, little while. So <clears throat> I'm actually going to talk a little bit more here um, <clears throat> about optimization. And if you think back to Vern's talk, he showed a picture of a landscape, a very mountainous landscape, um, and was saying that what we're trying to do with optimization is find the minimum. Um, <clears throat> nominally, we're trying to find what is called the global minimum. So if we traverse that whole landscape, we want to find the minimum point across every valley that is in that landscape. And that is typically a very time-consuming problem um, to solve. So we're going to start off here with a much simpler problem and uh, think about trying to find the minimum value of this particular landscape, which is simply a U-shape. Um, and we have uh, a ball here. Um, can you rewind this back to the start for me, please? So we have a ball here that uh, is going to be us. We're going to pretend we're traversing this landscape, and we want to find the minimum possible point. So the way to do that is to drop the ball. And if you'll stop it just there for me, thank you. Um, this is a very simple optimization problem can be solved classically any number of ways using any number of optimization routines that are available. This is not difficult at all, does not require a quantum computer in any sense. Um, if we play this on for a short period more, the question becomes what happens when the landscape is no longer smooth? If we stop it there for a second, then a classical algorithm has a very strong potential for getting stuck in what's called a local minima. We don't want to be stuck in a local minimum. We want to find the global minimum. We want to be right down at this uh, right-hand end um, where the, uh, the absolute minimum point here is. So the question is, how do we get there? So for a classical algorithm, what we would do is resort to something called a heuristic algorithm. Um, you might have heard of things called genetic algorithms. Um, you might have heard of simulated annealing or ant colony or particle swarming, all different types of um, heuristic optimization methods that essentially allow this ball to bounce around and nominally get over that hump. And hence, we hope, find the global minimum. Vern mentioned something called quantum tunneling. So what happens on a quantum computer? So if we play this to the end now, on a quantum computer, what happens is a little particle here has the ability to tunnel through the landscape and hence find the global minimum. I'm sort of simplifying things a little bit here, 
but generally this is what's going on on the quantum computer. Classically, what we would do is throw lots and lots of balls at this same problem. We would measure each of the results for all of those balls, and we would take the lowest one and assume that that is in the global minimum. There's no guarantee of that, but that's typically what's done. As I say, quantum computing, completely different here, and the quantum effects nominally allow us to tunnel through any landscape and find the absolute minimum value. So keep that in your mind um, as we talk about uh, some of the other things that we're, we're going to discuss here. So here's my mathematical equations. As I say, I don't want you walking away saying, oh, too much mathematics in this. This is all there's going to be. On the left-hand side, we have a very general optimization problem. Any of the optimization problems that have been discussed today can really be cast in this mathematical form. We have some function, that's our f here, that's our landscape. That's the thing that we want to find the minimum of. What can we play around to do that with? Well, what we can play around with are our x's here, they're our variables. We can maneuver them, think about this as, say, um, an asset management problem, and you're trying to find a mix of assets that uh, give you the minimum risk. So we've got all these different assets that we can play with, and we want to find out what combination of them, what weighting of them, gives us um, the minimum risk portfolio. Now, typically, all of our uh, variables have some constraints on them. We might have trading constraints, um, various constraints that say we're only allowed to invest between 20 and 40% of, uh, of our money in a particular sector, for instance. Linear, nonlinear combinations of the variables might come into play and all of those are constrained. So we have this very general problem that describes pretty much any sort of optimization problem that we want to deal with. That's on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we have the type of problem that the D-Wave machine solves. It's called a QBO, Quadratic Unconstrained Binary Optimization. Complications with that. The variables must be binary. Very rarely in finance do we deal with binary variables. They must be unconstrained. Pretty much everything we deal with in finance is a constrained problem. And the variables can only appear quadratically or linearly in our cost function. So the question is, how does somebody go from a very generic optimization problem to one that is suitable for solution on the D-Wave machine? And that's really where one qubit comes in. Our focus is in developing software that enables us to go from a formulation on the left here to a formulation on the right. So all of the work we do, typically we work in uh, Python, a little bit in C as well, but um, all of our work is involved in writing APIs to enable generic optimization problems to be recast in a format that is suitable for the D-Wave machine. Sometimes that's a reasonably easy task. Very often it's not an easy task. How difficult it is depends on the type of cost function, the type of variables, um, things like that that, uh, that uh, are in the formulation. OK, so again, remember that as we talk about some of these, these problems. So problems that um, appear very regularly in the finance space that can be solved on the D-Wave machine that uh, one qubit solves um, on a daily basis, typically, for, for various of our partners. So machine learning is a term that we've heard about today already. Um, machine learning um, can be broken up into various different areas. Um, the two that we've generally looked at are market graphs and neural networks. Neural networks were certainly mentioned a little bit today. Market graph, the terminology wasn't mentioned, but we saw some um, medical data earlier that was really um, a, a, a graph formulation of the problem. So each of the circles here, or if you think about this in three-dimensional space spheres, think of those as assets. The lines between them um, represent connections between those assets. In this particular case, assets are connected if they are highly correlated, whether it's 80% correlated or 70% doesn't really matter. Highly correlated assets. So highly correlated assets form what is called a clique, or in some instances, instances a quasi-clique. 
Um, that's what's called an NP-hard problem. It's a problem that grows exponentially. If you add one more asset to the problem, it is exponentially bigger. You add two more, it becomes exponentially bigger again. So this is the type of problem that is really ideally suited for the D-Wave machine. Um, how do we use this? Well, we use it to identify market anomalies. If over an historical period, various assets have been in this clique, and then all of a sudden, one or two or more of them drop out of the clique, then there needs to be some investigation involved of why that is. Is this, you can almost think of this as a pairs trading type of situation, except we're not talking about just pairs of assets, we're talking about cliques of assets. Neural networks were mentioned earlier today, and the goal with using neural networks for mining of uh, large data sets is really that the number of inputs that we can put into this should be very large. Let's not say infinite, but very large. So this is the sort of problem that was described earlier, where nominally we could develop a trading strategy based on is it the second Tuesday after a full moon, and did the trader catch the 850 train and wear red shoes today? We could put any sort of information that we wanted into our algorithm, throw it at the D-Wave machine that generates a, uh, a binary neural network, and get some sort of trading signal out at the other end. Again, we have uh, um, examples of doing this with, uh, with various trading sets that we have. Um, second type of problem, and I'll dig into this sort of problem in a little bit more detail than, um, than the previous ones, um, and that is um, single period optimization problems. So um, this is the classic um, portfolio optimization problem. We have various assets that we want to invest in, and um, given their historical risk and return, we want to determine um, the appropriate asset mix that we should be invested in today. Now, the single period model, um, if you look at the picture on the right hand there, if we don't have any constraints, which is the classic problem taught in business school, the classic problem is that we have some assets. Um, we uh, can't short them, say, so their percentage in the portfolio always lies between 0 and 1. The sum of the weights adds to 1, things like that. Um, that particular type of optimization, again, very, very simple to solve on a classical computer. No problem at all for any optimization algorithm worth its name. Um, where things become very difficult, though, is when real-world constraints start being put, on, put onto the portfolio. I owned something yesterday. I'm not trading in a vacuum. Trading constraints. What's it going to cost me to move from yesterday's optimal portfolio to today's po optimal portfolio? Are there any tax considerations? Cardinality constraints is a very difficult problem to incorporate here. So a cardinality constraint is simply the fancy mathematical way for saying I have a universe of, let's say, a 1,000 assets, and I'm only allowed to invest in 50 of them. What is that mix of 50 that I should invest in? They become very difficult problems, problems where, again, I mentioned things like um, genetic algorithms and simulated annealing as two ways of solving this particular type of problem. Um, we have, uh, as we'll see in a minute, we'll see some, uh, um, some more detailed snapshots of this particular optimization problem where um, we've included things like cardinality constraints and other practical constraints into our problem. And we're getting results that are um, determined in as fast a time as um, classical routines, often faster than classical routines, for a universe of assets, something like the, uh, um, the NASDAQ 1000, things like that. Sorry, the, 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 the Russell 1000 and the Russell 2000. Um, the third type of problem that we're looking at is multi-period optimization. So again, we're not generating assets here in a vacuum. We're saying we own a portfolio today. Um, we potentially own a different one tomorrow. We potentially own a different one the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and maybe a month out, maybe a year out, maybe 20 years out. How do we go about determining, based on things like our 
um, our projected returns or our expected returns for certain assets over that period of time? How do we go about generating portfolios that take that into account as part of the optimization strategy that we run? So we'll see a little bit more of that uh, type of problem in just a second. The other sort of problem that fits very squarely into the Cubo, the type of problem that D-Wave can solve, is something called the scheduling problem. Now, many of you, if not all of you, have probably heard of a problem called the traveling salesman problem. This is the traveling salesman problem. Again, it grows exponentially. You add a new point into this plot, and you've got an exponentially larger number of routes that could be flown. In terms of um, trading, we're looking at using this type of strategy for determining multi-period portfolios. Okay, so a little bit of a look at um, a single period optimization problem, just to show you some benchmarks. What do we do at one qubit when we start looking at a new problem? Well, the first thing we do is, how is this problem solved today? Um, how can that be um, reformulated as a cubo so that we can solve it on the D-Wave machine? Um, once we've done that, we need to determine how good a job we've done. So there's a couple of things we look at here. One of them is precision. If we're not getting the right result, then we're wasting our time. So on the left-hand side here, we have a picture. Again, we have this efficient frontier. Um, over on the left-hand side, this gray line is an unconstrained portfolio. The yellow dotted line, or yellow dots, represent a constrained portfolio in this particular case. And unfortunately, we don't have it laid on top of this, but um, if we were solving this using a classical algorithm, um, we would see that it would overlay directly on our yellow dots. So we're getting the right result from D-Wave. Um, that's a good start. The next thing that people always ask is, well, what about timing? How long does this take to run? Well, the promise really is that quantum computers in general will run very much faster than classical algorithms on very large data sets. And we're starting to see that breakout. A few people showed plots this morning um, where we had a knee in the curve where the exponential plot was suddenly, well, the plot was growing exponentially. Um, we're starting to see that with a lot of the portfolios that we're dealing with. So on the right-hand side here, we have some time comparisons for, um, I think this was for the, for the NASDAQ. Um, not the Russell 1000, I can't quite remember, but doesn't, uh, actually it doesn't really matter because across the bottom here we have the number of assets that we're dealing with. So um, here we go out to a couple of thousand assets, very large problem at that particular point, and timing up on the, uh, the y-axis. So our timing here is basically telling us that um, we expect that as the problem size starts to grow, um, the D-Wave machine will become much more effective than classical algorithms. This plot um, doesn't show it as well as some of the other uh, um, examples that we actually have. And I can see Peter um, over on the, uh, the stage right there, which probably means I'm running out of time. So I'm very quickly going to finish off here um, and just say that um, um, commercially available quantum computers are here. They are used. We use them daily. We have clients who use them daily. Don't get left behind. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.